Okay, we are going to do our lecture on chapter 36, Skin Integrity and Wound Healing. Um, this starts on page 1288 in your textbook. So first of all, when we're talking about skin in healthcare, we need to do a little anatomy review like we usually do. So let's, let's try to remember the structure of the skin. So um, the skin starts with the epidermis. So that's the outer portion of the skin made up of four to five layers, um, including the stratum corneum, which is that outermost layer of the epidermis, which functions as a barrier, right? So with that stratus corneum that restricts water loss, prevents fluids and pathogens and chemicals from getting into your body, okay? Then that second layer of that epidermis is um, the stratum germinativum. Okay, that is the innermost layer of the epidermis, continuously producing new cells with this one. Okay, continuously producing new cells. Okay, um, the second layer of skin, as you can see on this picture, we've got the epidermis on the top, and your second layer is the dermis. So this layer is made up of fibrous connective tissue, which provides strength and elasticity and has a great, great blood supply. Um, it includes sweat glands, sebaceous or oil glands, um, and then also hair, nail follicles, sensory receptors, and elastin and collagen um, that all resides there in the dermis. And then that third layer, the deepest layer, is the subcutaneous layer. So this is composed of connective and adipose tissue. Okay, when you think about... Um, um, when you think about this, you're thinking about providing insulation, okay? Because remember, adipose tissue is fat, okay? And we can see in this picture, this fatty layer of skin is going to be represented in like yellow bubbles, okay? So when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about providing insulation. We know that fat keeps us warm. So that subcutaneous layer, that fatty layer of skin keeps us warm. Um, it protects us, um, causes a little cushion um, to avoid injury, helps us reserve calories, um, and it varies in thickness depending on the body site that you're looking at, okay? So when we start to talk about giving injections, you'll have injections that'll be given the subcutaneous route. And so just think about that when we get to talking about that, that this is where you're, you're shooting to give that injection is in that adipose tissue there. Um, in order to provide optimal function, we need all layers of the skin to be intact. Okay, that is our barrier to the outside world. So what are some factors affecting skin integrity? Well, age, okay, age affects the condition and the structure of the skin. Um, older adult skin is less elastic, it's drier, it has reduced collagen, and you'll see areas of hyperpigmentation, which means it's darker, darker spots in some areas. Um, and then more prone to injury. If you've ever seen an elderly patient get skin tears, they just, sometimes it seems like their skin just tears and breaks really easily. Um, infants and young children, as well as older adult skin, they also um, deal with thinner skin that's more permeable, okay? That's what uh, promotes, that's what predisposes infants and the elderly to skin breakdown for that reason, okay? So age. Also, mobility status. As we know, when we're thinking about skin, we're always thinking about mobility status. That's a huge, huge factor. Um, so patients at risk for developing pressure injury are those with immobility, friction and shear, um, where maybe they're, they're moving, maybe you've mo moved them all the way up in bed and they keep sliding down in bed. That could cause an area of skin breakdown. Um, also, moisture. So we're talking about incontinence, okay? Uh, poor nutrition. Remember, we talk about protein and how important that is for um, skin healing and skin maintenance. So poor nutrition can definitely factor into that. Um, perfusion, right? So when you're thinking about perfusion, that means the blood supply. So the blood's coming from the heart and it's perfusing to all the vital organs, to the skin, all of that. So if there's areas of the skin that are not receiving adequate perfusion, that blood supply is what gives it the nutrients. So that perfusion is super, super important. And a lot of times in elderly patients, you'll see that uh, maybe they, especially in, in patients with diabetes or whatever, they'll get a lots of um, areas on their feet. And the reason for that is because there's not, 
there's not as much perfusion that far away from the heart. It's the farthest part from the heart. So it's not getting at the best perfusion as this patient ages. So we're talking about the elderly in this situation, right? So perfusion plays a large role because it, it brings all those nutrients. And if it's not able to do so, you have no blood supply, you have no nutrients, you have tissue death. Okay. Tissue death. Um, anyway, all of these things are going to contribute to mobility status, even altered level of consciousness. If, if your patient is a, um, post-op surgical patient, or if maybe they're in a coma because they just got into a traumatic accident or something like that, they're at high risk for, um, skin breakdown. A healthy person moves and shifts position unconsciously when you sense pressure or discomfort. Okay, so think about sitting on your butt for multiple hours here in class, okay? And your butt starts to go numb. Or if you've made a long distance drive and your butt starts to go numb, what do you do? You pick your butt up off the seat, you shift your weight from one butt cheek to the other one, and that's how you um, allow that blood supply to come back. So that numb feeling that you get in your butt when you get to be sitting for a long time, what you're feeling is called ischemia, okay? Ischemia, that means that there's no blood supply in that area, okay? And that's the reason you're feeling that. So when you shift your weight from one butt cheek to the other, you're allowing the blood supply to return to that area of your bottom that was feeling uncomfortable, okay? However, for patients who are unable to move independently, the weight of their body on that area or maybe the weight of their body on the bed, or if they're touching on the chair or anything, that's going to cause an increase in pressure on the tissues. So like I said, that ischemia, that loss of blood supply, if they don't move, or even if you don't move, it's going to be painful. But if you don't move, you're going to cause tissue death. You're going to cause pressure areas. Okay. That is how they happen. Okay. So immobility, huge factor, huge factor. Okay. Um, so you're looking at patients with impaired mobility, such as complete bed rest or conditions that limit activity like paralysis or extreme fatigue, a high risk pregnancy, someone that's sedated, um, someone that's wearing a cast. That's a big one. Um, or some kind of altered sensory perception. So what that means is they don't feel the way that they should. Maybe their nerve endings are not working as, as they should. So patients who are diabetic or have peripheral neuropathy, if you've ever heard of that, that just means they have no feeling in their lower extremities. And so if you had no feeling in your butt when you were driving that 25 hour road trip, if you, had, if you couldn't feel your butt anyway, you would just sit on your butt until you got this big pressure wound because you couldn't feel those warning signs, like a normal person would feel that area start to go numb. But if you have sensory perception issues, you don't feel that like a normal person would. So immobility, huge one. Can't stress that enough. Um, nutrition. So that's also going to affect skin integrity. So healthy skin depends on adequate nutrition and hydration to maintain that good skin integrity. Okay. Adequate protein levels. They maintain the skin and repair minor defects and preserve that intravascular volume. So that blood supply that we need so much. Okay. Protein, protein, protein. I can't stress that enough either. Vitamin C, zinc, and copper are also involved in collagen formation. So we want to make sure that there's nutrition in that aspect. Both dry, dehydrated, as well as edematous or swollen, overhydrated skin are both prone to injury. Okay. Whether it's dehydrated or overhydrated, both are prone to injury. Okay. Especially when exposed to pressure, shearing, friction, or moisture as an incontinence. Okay. Um, and then clients with diminished sensation, right? So sensation level is going to affect that skin integrity. So these patients with diminished sensation are less able to sense a hot surface and would likely suffer a burn or the same example I used earlier when speaking about this, the, the numb, butt. if they don't, if they can't feel their butt, then obviously they're going to just continue to sit there, even though they're causing tissue death, tissue damage, right? Um, so a cut or a wound in an area with limited sensation may go unnoticed and therefore untreated. Uh, they're also unable to feel uh, pressure in an affected area, like I said, um, and they may not get those cues to change areas. And then lastly, um, patients with impaired cognition. So we're talking patients with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, an altered level of consciousness for some reason. They're at higher risk for pressure injury because they're not aware of that need to change positions.
All right. Um, continuing on. So impaired circulation. So with impaired circulation restricts activity. It produces pain. So when we're talking about impaired circulation, we're again talking about perfusion issues. So perfusion of blood to the vital organs and tissues. Okay. So it restricts activity. It produces pain. It leads to muscle atrophy, which is the shrinking or wasting away of muscle. And it leads to the development of thin tissue that is then prone to ischemia, which as we know now is um, uh, where the blood stops, right? A, a lack of blood flow. Ischemia is a lack of blood flow. And so it um, produces thin tissue that is prone to ischemia and necrosis. So when you're thinking about necrosis, that just means dead tissue, okay? That's that black tissue that you've seen in probably pictures of pressure wounds and things. So impaired venous circulation results, results in engorged tissues with high levels of metabolic waste products that are prone to edema or swelling and ulceration where ulcers form and breakdown, which will eventually turn into a wound, right? So forms of circulatory impairment delay wound healing, right? Because there's no blood supply, there's no nutrients, okay? In fact, circulatory impairment is one of the main causes of chronic wounds. Uh, moving on to medication. So medications that cause pruritus or itching or dermatoses, which is another word for rash, um, photosensitivity, which is light sensitivity or alopecia, which is uh, baldness, uh, hair loss, um, or pigmentation changes. Any medications involving those situations can often result in changes that impair skin integrity or delay healing. So that should be considered as well. Also moisture. So that's another huge one when we're talking about skin. Exposure to moisture leads to maceration. Okay. That's what you can see in this picture here is maceration. What that is, is it's a softening of the skin and it increases the likelihood of skin breakdown. So this is your big red flag, your big warning sign. Okay. You're going to get maceration from incontinence, incontinence and fever. Okay. Remember We've learned this already, that fevers cause that loss of fluid, right? When we go up in um, our temperature, we're losing fluid. And so patients who are sweating maybe um, in that area and it's left to sit on the skin and, and also in combination with incontinence, um, these are the most common sources of moisture that you're going to look at for maceration. Okay. You need to know what that is. Um, and then talking about fever, again, first it leads to sweating, which then can cause maceration. Second, it increases the metabolic rate. Remember up to 7% per one degree Fahrenheit that your temperature goes up. Your metabolic rate goes up 7%, right? We learned that. Um, thereby it, re it raises the tissue demand for oxygen, okay? An increased demand for oxygen is difficult to meet if there's any type of circulatory impairment or tissue compression, secondary to pressure, okay? So we just kind of screwed ourselves at this point, right? So that's fever. Um, infection, so infection implies that microorganisms are causing harm by releasing toxins, invading body tissues, and increasing the metabolic demand of the tissue. So infection of the skin makes it more vulnerable to breakdown and it impedes the healing of open wounds. So they already have a wound, it got infected, you're gonna see slow to heal or no healing. It's gonna to continue to get worse with an infection. If it's not stopped, then that bacteria can gain access to the systemic circulation, which means it goes right into the bloodstream and now you're septic, okay? Lifestyle, so other lifestyle factors that can contribute to skin integrity, tanning. Tanning exposes the skin to UV radiation, thereby increasing the risk for skin cancer. Um, frequent bathing or frequent use of soap removes the healthy skin oils that can lead to dry skin that um, jeopardizes that skin's barrier function. But also infrequent cleansing of the skin can contribute to excessive oiliness, clogged sebaceous glands, and inadequate removal of microbes on the skin, which can also cause a wound lesion or infection. Um, and then body piercings and tattoos. Those always have a risk for infection and scarring, okay? 
to test your knowledge of the following factors, which would put a client at greatest risk for impaired skin integrity? A, medication of digoxin, B, moisture, C, decreased sensation, or D, dehydration? So this is another one of those NCLEX style questions that you've gotta learn how to prioritize, okay? So you wanna think, um, you kind of got to think outside of the box with this one. So with medication, digoxin is just a cardiac med. It's not going to put them at, at a, a great risk for impaired skin integrity. So we can get rid of that one right off the bat. Um, the next three options are all pretty good options. Um, and so you, this is where you kind of got to prioritize. So the correct answer here is decreased sensation. So decreased sensation would greatly increase the risk for injury with a tear or break in the skin. Okay, this could let, uh, lead to delay in seeking treatment due to lack of awareness. And by the time they catch that they actually have a wound or something, it could already be really bad, okay? Whereas moisture and dehydration also could be contributing factors, it is not the most correct answer. All right, so when we're talking about classifying wounds, so there's a bajillion different types of wounds. You can find descriptions about them on page 1293, table 36-1, okay? So what are wounds? Wounds are a disruption in normal skin integrity. And we know that if there's a, nor if there is a disruption, then we're gonna have all kinds of issues from risk to infection, to sensory abilities, to insulation, to a variety of factors, right? So you will need to be able to identify and document different types of wounds. So use this chart to start to think about what these are called and what they look like, as well as how they affect the skin. OK, so this box here is important. So these are all breaks in the skin. OK, all of these, an abrasion, an abscess, a contusion, which is not it's not open. A contusion is like a bruise, right? A crushing. An incision, laceration, penetrating wound, puncture, tunneling, okay? So all of these things, some of them may not make sense to you, but you need to know the difference between these, okay? Because I'm not going to ask you a question on your test, like what is a contusion? But there may be a question on the test that has, um, that has these words in it, and you're going to need to know what it means, okay? And that, that goes for all of the medical terminology found in your book, really, okay? All right, so wound classification. So different kinds of wounds exist, right? So let's go through kind of what these mean. So an open or closed wound. So a wound is considered open if there is a break in the skin or mucous membranes, okay? So open wounds include abrasions, lacerations, puncture wounds, and surgical incisions. So a puncture wound, meaning if you've ever um, seen somebody who's had, uh, like, had like a robotic surgery, the laparoscopic surgery, they have just these little punch holes in their belly where the robot had went in and did the procedure and then they just have these little poke holes, okay? Those are called puncture wounds, okay? Now, if there's no breaks in the skin, the wound is described as a closed wound. So a contusion, for example, or a bruise or tissue swelling from a fracture, these are common closed wounds, okay? Then so, so your wound can be any or all of these, okay? So it can be open, it can be closed. You have, so any wound can be open or closed. You kind of pick one. Any wound can be either acute or chronic. So acute wounds are expected to be of short duration. So in a healthy person, these wounds heal spontaneously without complications um, through the three phases of wound healing, which include inflammation, proliferation, and maturation, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Um, and then wounds that are exceeded or that have exceeded the expected length of recovery are classified as chronic wounds. So these have been longstanding wounds. Okay. Um, your wound can be either clean or contaminated or infected. Okay. So clean wounds are uninfected wounds with minimal inflammation. Um, Let's see, contaminated wounds include open traumatic wounds or surgical incisions in which a major break in asepsis has occurred. 
Okay, the risk for infection is high in these wounds. Wounds are considered infected when bacterial kinds of counts in the wound tissues are above 100,000 organisms per one gram of tissue. Um, and that's kind of your, that's your contaminated wound. There's another um, subcategory called the clean contaminated wound. Okay, and these ones are surgical incisions that enter the GI, respiratory, or urinary tracts. Um, in these, there's an increased risk of infection for these wounds, but there's no obvious infection, okay? And then your wound can be either superficial, partial thickness, or full thickness. So for a superficial wound, these involve only the epidural, epidermal layer of skin, so that very top layer of skin. The injury is usually the result of friction, shearing, or burning, okay? That's your superficial wound. A partial thickness wound extends all the way through the epidermis, but not all the way through the dermis, okay? And you can see these pictures. Use these pictures, okay? So that you see your partial thickness wound there. Um, and then a full thickness wound. A full thickness wound extends into the subcutaneous tissue. Remember that fatty tissue and beyond, right? Okay, you need to know the difference between those. Um, and then the descriptor, if you ever hear a penetrating wound, this is sometimes added to indicate that wounds involve internal organs or that there is something lodged within the body that has created a wound. For example, they were stabbed with a knife and the end broke off and the end of it is in the wound. That would be a penetrating wound, okay? All right, wound healing. Um, so always, as always, follow along with the picture as I, as I talk, because these pictures are great visuals for you. So regeneration. So when we're talking about the wound healing process. Regeneration is when a wound affects only the epidermis and the dermis. Okay. Regenerative healing takes place and no scar forms and the new or regenerated epithelial dermal and dermal cells form new skin that cannot be distinguished from the intact skin. Partial thickness wounds heal by regeneration. Okay, so you have a break in the skin somehow, they heal and it results in, um, it results in, in no, not being able to tell that there ever was any break in the skin there ever. We've all had a wound like this before, right? So that's healing by regeneration, okay? No scar and only in those epidermal wounds, okay? We've all had one of those before. Then there is healing by primary intention. So when a wound involves minimal or no tissue loss and has edges that are well approximated. So when we talk about well approximated, we mean that they come together well. They match on both sides and they come together as one piece. Um, then they heal by primary intention, okay, with, with those parameters. Little scarring is, an, is expected in these wounds. A clean surgical incision would be an example of this, primary intention. So if you look at this picture on um, letter A there at the top, that is a wound healing by primary intention. So they made a slice in this area, they sutured it right after they were done, and then it results in a little scar. Minimal scarring, but still a scar nonetheless. Um, and then there's healing by secondary intention. So when healing by secondary intention, this occurs when a wound involves extensive tissue loss, which prevents wound edges from approximating. That just means they have crazy edges. They don't come together like they should. They don't meet up. They don't meet up. The wound is too big, so they don't meet up, okay? Um, so it prevents those wound edges from approximating or should not be closed because it's infected, possibly. That could also be another reason. Or it's been too long since the wound has occurred. All of these reasons could be reasons that a wound heals by secondary intention. So because that wound is left open, it heals from the inner layer to the surface by fi filling in with red granulation tissue, which is a form of connective tissue with a very abundant blood supply. Okay, so wounds that heal by secondary intention heal more slowly, are more prone to infection, and develop more scar tissue. So it's important to create interventions that prevent infections on these patients. 
A pressure injury and an infected wound is an example of that. So if you've ever seen a pressure injury, it's almost like a, just a crater. Think of it as a crater. There's no way to take those two sides of skin and bring them together to, um, to suture or anything. You just can't do that. So it has to heal from the inside out. Okay, that's, that's your secondary intention. You can see that in the in picture B there on the, the slide. And then there is tertiary intention. So that's the third kind or the fourth kind. So a wound heals by tertiary healing. This occurs when two surfaces of granulation tissue are then brought together. Okay, so this technique may be used when the wound is clean contaminated or contaminated. Right. So initially, the wound is allowed to heal by secondary intention as it tries. Right. When there's no evidence of edema, infection, or wound edges, or or whatever, then the wound edges are closed by bringing together that granulating tissue. So that's that inside tissue, that pink tissue that you can see in letter C on the screen. That pink tissue. Okay. So they bring that um, granulation tissue together and they suture it to the surface. Okay, they suture the surface together. These kinds of wounds require strict, strict aseptic technique. Okay, that means sterile, right? Um, during all dressing changes because they're very prone to infection. So you guys will learn how to do sterile wound care. And this is an example, tertiary, tertiary intention. This is an example of when you would use sterile wound care. So tertiary intention healing creates less scarring than in secondary intention, but more, but it's more than primary intention healing. You'll have more scarring than in that. All right. So phases of wound healing. Wound healing occurs in three phases. Okay, so phase one, this is the inflammatory phase. This is a phase that lasts from one to five days and can consist of two major processes. So hemostasis and inflammation. Hemostasis, at the time of injury, tissue and capillaries are destroyed, causing blood and plasma to leak into the wound, okay? Area vessels constrict to limit that blood loss. Platelets aggregate or clump together to slow that bleeding. And at the same time, the clotting mechanism is activated to form a blood clot. All of that happens in hemostasis, all of that in the inflammatory phase of wound healing, okay? Then inflammation. This is the second part of that inflammatory phase. So inflammation, the inflama inflammatory reaction is characterized by edema, which means swelling, right? Erythema, which means redness, pain, temperature elevation, and migration of white blood cells into those wound tissues. Okay, so within 24 hours, macrophages, those white blood cells begin to engulf that bacteria, otherwise known as phagocytosis, right? and clearing that debris. So along with plasma proteins and fibrin, they form a scab on the wound surface, which seals, in the, which seals the wound and helps to prevent any kind of microbial invasion, okay? So that is the first one to five days, that's the inflammatory phase. Um, then we move into the proliferative phase, okay? So the proliferative phase consists of granulation, and with that, it um, occurs between days five and 21. So cells develop to fill the wound defect and resurface the skin okay, in granulation. Fibroblasts or connective tissue cells, they migrate to the wound where they form collagen, which is a protein substance that adds strength to that healing wound, okay? And then new blood and lymph vessels sprout from existing capillaries at the edge of the wound. That result is the formation of granulation tissue, which is a beefy red tissue. Okay, granulation tissue is a beefy red tissue that bleeds readily and is easily damaged, okay? And as the clot or scab is dissolved, epithelial cells begin to grow into the wound from the surrounding healthy tissue and seal over that wound. That is called epithelialization. Okay, so that is phase two, the proliferative phase. And then we move into phase three. So this is the maturation phase. So with epithelialization, that's, that's part of this. So this phase, also called remodeling, you can call it the maturation phase or the remodeling, okay? This is the final phase of the healing process. 
it begins in the second or third week and continues until after the wound has closed. Over the next three to six months, the initial collagen fibers that were laid in the wound um, during that proliferative phase are broken down and remodeled and organized into an organized structure, such as scar tissue. Think of it like scar tissue. Okay. Oopsie, the right one. Yes. Okay. So wound closures. So there's a variety of different kinds of wound closures as well. So we can close our wounds with adhesive strips, right? So uh, um, as an example, steri strips. If you've ever worked in long term care and you've seen steri strips, which they don't really use a ton anymore, they use them sometimes on my labor unit. Um, for C-sections, but not very often anymore. Um, but you can use these to close very superficial, low tension wounds, such as skin tears or lacerations. Um, you can close the skin on a wound that has been closed subcutaneously to aid in healing and reduce scarring. Um, you can use it to give additional support to a wound after sutures or staples have been removed. Um, or you can use adhesive strips to um, keep up there. They typically keep these in place um, until they begin to separate from the skin. So typically we just tell patients, try not to get them wet, they'll dry out and fall off on their own. So in that um, picture, stereo strips are right in the middle and you'll see them, they're kind of like, almost look like little paper tape, okay? And then there's sutures. So sutures are to the left of your screen. Um, and these are the traditional wound closures, um, otherwise known as stitches, okay? So suturing creates small puncture wounds along the track of the laceration or the incision. And several types of suture materials are available. So there's absorbent sutures, um, which are used for deep in the tissues, for example, to close um, an organ or a tissue for some reason, um, because they're made of material that will gradually dissolve. So we use these in uh, our labor unit when somebody has a perineal tear after they push their baby out, they've torn a little bit. Um, we use those dissolvable stitches in, in our field. So those are absorbent sutures. Non-absorbent sutures are placed in superficial tissues and require removal, usually by the nurse. So we do remove, remove sutures, okay? Um, surgical staples. So staples are to the right of your screen. So with staples, they're made of lightweight titanium. They provide fast and easy ways to close an incision, and they are associated with a lower risk of infection and tissue reaction than our sutures. The downside of staples is that some wound edges are more difficult to align. And the most common sites for wound stapling end up ends up being the arms, legs, abdomen, back, scalp, and the bowel. Wounds on the hands, feet, and neck and face are typically not stapled. And then there's surgical glue, which you can see to the right. This is, at least in my field, what they use most often um, for C-sections. Um, and this is just a safe use uh, in clean, low tension wounds. So it's ideal wound closure method for uh, skin tears is what your book will say. Um, I've worked in long-term care and I don't think that they can afford this surgical glue. So I've never seen it there, but whatever. So learning about wound drainage, you need to know this. You need to know the difference of the, these kinds of wound drainages. And so here's, some, there's a great picture here on this slide to show you the difference between these types of um, drainage. So cirrhosis exudate, okay? Clean wounds typically drain cirrhosis exudate, okay? Um, it, it's watery in consistency and um, it contains very little cellular matter, okay? So it consists of serum, hence cirrhosis, and it is straw colored. It's a straw colored fluid that separates out of blood when a clot is form, formed. Okay. And that's kind of how that goes. You can't, yeah, you can see it. It's actually the second one from the left in that picture. It's like a straw colored, barely detectable on that piece of gauze. Um, next, sanguineous bloody drainage. That's what's called sanguineous bloody drainage. Okay. In sanguineous exudate, which exudate just means drainage. Okay. Exudate means drainage. So sanguineous exudate um, typically occurs when deep wounds or wounds that are in highly vascular areas. Okay. With a, with an abundant blood supply. So sanguineous exudate is bloody drainage. It indicates damage to capillaries. Okay, so if it's fresh bleeding, it's going to produce bright red drainage, whereas older dried blood is going to look reddish brown. Okay, 
So sanguinous, you can see that as the, uh, the, the fourth one from the left on your picture. Um, and then there's serosanguinous. So with serosanguinous, this is a combination of bloody and serose drainage. It's typically thin in consistency, okay? Um, you'll see it in this picture as the first one from the left. So it's kind of just like a pinkish in color. It's a serosanguinous drainage. You see that one a lot, I feel like. And then um, purulent, purulent drainage. This is thick. It's a thick drainage and it's often smells bad. Um, and it's drainage that is seen in infected wounds. Okay, it contains pus. It contains a protein, um, pus, which is a protein rich fluid filled with white blood cells. Okay, filled with white blood cells. So bacteria and cellular debris. That's what you're seeing in purulent drainage, okay? It's commonly caused by infection from bacteria, um, such as strep or staph. Um, typically the pus color is, it's yellow in color, although it may take on a bluish or green color if a certain bacteria is present, okay? So when we're talking about purulent drainage, we're talking about something's infected and it smells bad, okay? Um, so make sure that when you are documenting, either in your DocuCare or throughout your career, you are using these correct terms. I don't want to hear you or see you document pus present, okay? You should say purulent exudate or purulent drainage is fine, okay? And then there's purosanguinous drainage, and that just is uh, blood and pus, okay? So again, you can see the purulent drainage here, the third one from the left in that kind of color. All right, so complications of wound healing. So hemorrhage could be a complication. So hemorrhage just means excessive bleeding. So the risk of hemorrhage is greatest in the first 24 to 48 hours following surgery or injury. Swelling to the affected body part, pain and changes in vital signs, such as we may see what you will learn. We will see decreased blood pressure and elevated pulse in patients who have increased bleeding, okay? That's for another lecture though. Um, but this may indicate internal bleeding, okay? Um, also, infection. So infection could be exhibited by localized swelling, redness, heat, pain, fever, smell, bad smell, foul smelling, purulent drainage, or a change in the color of the drainage, okay? All of these are signs of infection that you need to know because those are signs you're looking for in all areas, especially wounds, okay? Dehiscence, as you can see on my little pretty picture here on the slide, dehiscence is a rupture or a separation of one or more layers of a wound, okay? So wound dehiscence is most likely to occur in the inflammatory phase of healing before large amounts of collagen have been deposited into the wound to strengthen it. Um, most common causes of dehiscence are poor nutritional status, inadequate closure of the muscles, or a wound infection, okay? So dehiscence and evisceration, as you can see in my picture, um, a lot of people confuse the two. So that's why they made this little pretty picture. So just to kind of, you need to know the difference between the two. So in evisceration, this is a total separation of the layers of a wound in which internal viscera or organs protrude through the incision, okay? So dehiscence means, um, as you can see my D right here, you see the D, the D is split open. Okay, split open layer of a surgical wound. It's just split open and it's fine. It just maybe needs to be restapled. Okay, that's dehiscence. Evisceration, as you can see the E, this E wound here has split open and now organs are falling out. So this person's bowel has fallen out, right? So, so evisceration is the extrusion of the organs through the surgical wound. Okay, it's important to know the difference of those. Um, evisceration is a rare complication, but it is a surgical emergency. So if you ever see this, you need to immediately cover the wound with sterile towels or dressings that are soaked in a sterile saline solution to prevent those organs from drying out and becoming contaminated with bacteria from the environment. Okay, that's important to know. Um, make sure your patient stays in bed with their knees bent to minimize the strain on that incision. 
notify the surgeon and be ready for the patient to go to a surgical procedure. Okay. And then a fistula formation. This is another complication. So this is an abnormal passage connecting two body cavities or a cavity in the skin. So fistulas often result from infection. An abscess forms, which breaks down surrounding tissues and creates an abnormal passageway. Chronic drainage from the fistula may lead to skin breakdown and delayed wound healing. The most common sites where fistulas form are the GI tract and the GU tract. So this means somebody's bowel may be connected to their bladder. So they may pee out of their bottom or they may have stool out of their vagina. I've seen that before. So yes, fistulas are no fun. All right, so test your knowledge. So a client calls the nurse to the room and says, look, my incision is popping open where they did my hip surgery. The nurse notes that the wound edges have separated one centimeter at the center and there is a straw colored fluid leaking from one end. The nurse's best action is to A, notify the surgeon's stat, B, place a clean sterile four by four over the incision and monitor the drainage, C, wrap an ACE bandage firmly around the area and have the client main, maintain bed rest, or D, immediately cover the wound with sterile towels soaked in normal saline and call the surgeon. So the correct answer here is answer B, place a clean sterile four by four over the incision and monitor the drainage. A one centimeter separation is very, very, very small. Okay, it's actually, it's too small to truly be termed a dehiscence, okay? Um, so when you're looking at these, you always want to look at, you don't really, not very often are you gonna pass the ball off to notify the surgeon stat type thing. We wanna know what are you gonna do about it as the nurse, okay? So we can get rid of that surgeon situation. And because of the size of this, it's not a stat type of situation. One centimeter is not very big. Um, we don't know anything about applying an ACE bandage to any type of wound. We're not going to be doing that because nobody, that's just, we're not doing that. And then letter D, immediately cover the wound with sterile towels soaked in normal saline and call the surgeon. That would be an appropriate answer for an evisceration, right? When the bowel is protruding or an organ is protruding through that incision, that would be an appropriate, um, that would be an appropriate answer. However, this, this, um, particular question is insinuating that it is a dehiscence, but it's much too small to truly be termed a dehiscence. All right, moving on to our nursing process. So our nursing assessment, we're going to do a skin assessment. So the Braden scale, we're going to use the Braden scale. Okay, so what the Braden scale is, this is a numeric value for six risk factors related to impaired skin integrity that evaluates six major of those risk factors. So it evaluates these six things, sensory perception, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition, and friction and shear. Okay, it evaluates all of those. After you determine your patient's risk factor, you get a final score. That final score on the Braden scale reflects the patient's risk. The lower the score, the more likely the patient will develop a pressure injury. A score of 18 or less for hospitalization, for hospitaliza hospitalized patients indicates a risk for pressure injury. So we want it to be above 18. However, most likely in a hospital, it's not going to be above 18 because a lot of them, if not all of them, are at risk for a um, skin breakdown, right? Please remember that pressure in the hospitalized setting is our number one culprit because it causes decreased blood flow to the area. It causes ischemia or decreased blood flow to the area. Pressure is our number one problem, right? Right. Um, so again, we want to keep it above 18 with the Braden scale, but it probably won't be because remember a lot of them are at risk. And so then another scale that we use for a skin assessment is the Norton scale. So this one um, assesses risk based on the patient's physical condition, mental state, activity, mobility, and incontinence. And that's just another one. I don't see that one used very much, honestly. 
And then we want to do um, a wound assessment. So if they already have a wound, we want to assess the wound. And by doing that, we want to know where is the wound located? Do we have to describe the wound location? And we have to use anatomical terms. Okay, we can't say butt wound, right? We want to say wound on their coccyx or wound on their glute, something like that. Left glute, right glute. We use anatomical terms. We do not use layman's terms when we're charting, okay? So in another location, we want to know, um, oh, and you and, and be aware also that location affects the rate of healing in wounds, okay? So wounds that are in highly vascular regions, such as on the scalp or on the hands, those are going to heal much quicker than ones that are on the abdomen or on the heel that far away from the heart, okay? So keep that in mind as well. Um, and then also a location of the wound can give you clues to the wound etiology or the cause of the wound, right? So a wound over a bony prominence could be related to pressure. It likely is, okay? So when we're talking about a bony prominence, we're talking about the backs of the elbows, okay? Um, the coccyx, where that coccyx bones, they're right there on the bottom. Um, things like that, Um and, and the heels also, the heels are a big one in between the knees. All of these could be from, from pressure. Okay. Um, whereas if you're going to find one on the bottom of the foot, it's likely from as a diabetic foot ulcer versus any kind of pressure. Okay. So then we're going to move on. We're going to talk about the wound size. So we're going to measure the length. So the up and down, and then the width, which is the side to side of the wound of the wound and we're going to measure it in centimeters it's already it's always measured in centimeters okay um so that's just you guys will learn how to do that skill in lab as well okay and then you also would would measure the depth as well which we'll teach you how to do in lab um you want to document if there's any undermining or tunneling so this is, if you look at my picture here, this is gonna tell you what these things are and we'll show you this in lab as well. So what is tunneling? Tunneling is a narrow opening or passageway that can extend in any direction through the soft tissue and result in dead space within, with as a potential for abscess formation, okay? Also known as a sinus tract. To measure, you're gonna put a sterile tips, cotton tip applicator into the tunnel, grasp it at the wound where the wound starts, that where that tunnel starts, and then you'll hold it up to a ruler to measure that, okay? So that's tunneling. A lot of times you'll see people pack the tunneling. And the reason people pack a wound or pack the tunneling is so that it can heal from the inside out how we want it to. We don't want skin to heal right on top of a giant crater because that's just not structurally sound, okay? And then undermining. So this is the destruction of underlying tissue, which surrounds some or all of the wound margin. So it's almost like the wounds wearing a little hat is kind of what it seems like. This will make much more sense when I can show you in person, okay? Um, so with this, it may extend in one or in many directions. It may be around the whole edge of the wound, okay? Um, and so to measure this, you're going to check for undermining at each hour of the clock. So we kind of look at a wound as a clock face so that we can document where the tunneling is. There's a tunneling track at three o'clock. There's undermining from 12 o'clock to six o'clock, something like that. Okay. So you insert a sterile cotton tipped applicator into the undermining depth, grasp the wound edge and measure it against the, in, against the ruler. Okay. And again, you're going to use the face of a clock on how to um, determine where it's at, right? Then we're going to assess the wound's appearance. So we're gonna look at the peri wound, which is the skin around the wound. So is there skin discoloration? This may indicate there's a hematoma or additional injury to the surrounding tissue. Um, we're gonna look for maceration. Was there any maceration there? Um, was there undermining? Is there blistering? Is there erythema? Is there slough? Is there eschar? I don't know if I have pictures of slough and eschar on here. I hope that I do in a couple of slides, but when you think about sloth, you're thinking about, oh, I think I do have a picture actually as we get to it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So sloth is like, it's like a white or yellowish stringy, but attached piece of fibrous tissue on the wound. Okay. 
Um, and then there's SCAR, which is basically dead necrotic tissue. And again, I think I have a picture of that. So I'll show you in a couple of slides. But yeah, we would document, is there sloth? Is there SCAR? Okay, in the appearance of the wound. We're going to assess for drainage. So we're going to assess for the amount, the color, and the odor. Okay. We're going to assess for erythema and swelling. Is there redness? Is there swelling? These are often signs of infection or um, more damage. Is the patient having pain? So pain is often an early symptom of infection. Um, but sometimes these wounds are so, so deep that they go extend below the pain receptors and they feel absolutely nothing. So sometimes as you're healing a super, super bad wound, you'll notice as you go in every day to change this wound, as it starts to heal and be better and that blood supply comes back, you'll notice that your patient starts to have pain. Whereas they didn't before, now that the wound is healing, they're starting to have pain and discomfort. And that's a great sign because that means that the, that blood flow is coming back to that area. And then nutritional status. So we want to screen and assess the nutritional status of each patient admitted with a pressure injury. Okay. And we know why, because nutrition is super important with skin, right? Um, so laboratory data. So the most common laboratory assessments related to skin integrity are going to be protein levels, right? A complete blood count, um, glucose, thyroid and iron levels, coagulation studies, and possibly wound cultures. Okay. So we won't go into super depth on that. You'll have some information about lab coming up in a couple of weeks or on laboratory data. Um, so with wound cultures, they may be ordered by a physician to determine the types of bacteria present. Okay, if you think that it's infected, somebody might order a wound culture. Um, when getting a wound culture, they can be obtained by a swab, which is what we're going to go over now, because um, you guys are going to actually perform this skill in the lab. So when swabbing, the most common and most non-invasive method to obtain a culture is with a swab. Okay, so swab specimens have been shown to be acceptably accurate in representing bacteria counts um, from a wound. Okay. So we'll kind of walk you through how to do that when we get to, um, to lab, but just know that that's how we're mostly going to do it. You can also get, um, you can also get a culture from a needle aspiration of a wound, which involves inserting a needle into the tissue and taking out the tissue fluid. Um, or you can do a tissue biopsy, which is the most accurate method. Um, however, it's the most invasive. So tissues removed from the wound by a specially trained provider and it's sent to pathology and they look at it that way. So moving on to our diagnoses. So all of these are diagnoses here that would apply to a patient that's having um, issues with skin integrity. So risk for impaired skin integrity or just impaired skin integrity, impaired tissue integrity, risk for impaired tissue integrity. All of these are approved, okay, for patients with skin issues. Um, nursing interventions related to wound care. So we're going to cleanse and irrigate the wound, right? So we commonly use irrigation or otherwise known as lavage to clean wounds by gently flushing liquid over them to clean off any debris from the wound. Okay. We have to instill that, um, which you guys will learn how to do this as well. Um, you have to instill that fluid with a moderate amount of force so that that can kind of flush the wound and anything away. Right. Um, and then caring for a drainage device. We will get more into this. You don't really need to know much about these drains except for what I'm about to tell you right here, but we'll go more into this um, our last couple weeks of lab when we talk about periop. Okay, but drainage devices, just need to know that there are things called drains, okay? Um, so there's open drains, which includes a Penrose drain, um, where fluid drains out of an open latex tube and collects in a gauze bag or a stoma bag. Okay, increased risk for infection with these ones because there's an open tube that communicates from inside the body to an open air surrounding skin, da, 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 da. okay? That's an open drain. There's things called closed drains, which is a Jackson Pratt drain. If you've ever seen a Jackson Pratt drain, I know you'll see that in lab as well. It's a, is this a picture of it? Yes. So if you look at the bottom of your screen here onto the left side, you'll see a JP drain there on the left. So. Um, that little square has a picture of it and it almost just looks like a little grenade to, in a way. And it's um, a drainage tube comes from inside the body and ends in a sealed bulb, that little grenade looking thing. Um, and what we do is that that 
bulb is collapsed and then a cap is placed on that so that it's constantly sucking the drainage out of the body. Okay. So what we do is we remove that drainage every few hours to measure it. Okay. Um, and then moving on to talking about debriding a wound. So when you're talking about debriding a wound, this is the removal of devitalized tissue or foreign material from a wound. So it helps remove cells that are alive, but that are not functioning. And it removes it from the wound bed and edges. So this includes removal of necrotic or dead tissue, removal of exudate, and removal of infective material that helps stimulate wound healing and prepare the wound bed for other types of therapies. Okay, so there's mechanical debriding, which um, may be performed via a lavage um, or the use of wet to dry dressings, which is where maybe you soak a piece of gauze and you put it on the wound. And then when, it, you know, you, rip, you take it off in like a couple of days and it's dried out and you kind of rip off anything that's stuck to that gauze. Okay, and it sounds painful and it kind of is, but you don't ever want to wet that dressing again to get it off. The point of it is that you're ripping off that stuff that's stuck to it. You're debriding it, okay? Um, really, wet to dry dressings aren't as common now because it does damage the granulation tissue. Um, but I have seen it, and I do actually still see it a lot in long-term care. And then there's something called enzymatic debriding, debriding which uses... Um, different kinds of agents to break down necrotic tissue without affecting that viable tissue in the wound. Okay. So this would be a, um, some kind of like a uh, wound gel or something. If you've ever heard of Santal, that's one of the, that's one of the types of wound gels that helps to breed wounds. Okay. Um, and then there's other stuff that you can use that we don't really need to get a whole lot into, but just know autolysis, this is debriding um, using an occlusive moisture retaining dressing and the body's own enzymes and defense mechanisms to break down that tissue, okay? This one takes longer than other techniques, but it's typically tolerated better. And then there's biotherapy, which this is a fun one. So this is the use of medical grade larva of green bottle flies to dissolve dead and infected tissue from wounds. So we're talking maggots, people, okay? Maggot therapy, it's an actual thing. It's an actual thing. Um, so those enzymes, so those larvae, they actually secrete enzymes that liquefy dead tissue and create an alkaline environment, okay? So healthy tissue in this process is unharmed. The larva also digest bacteria from the wound. And this therapy is effective and simple to use but containing the larva within the dressing can be problematic, okay? I've never seen this done, but I have actually heard of them doing it at a local hospital, okay? And then sharp debriding. This is the use of a sharp, sterile instrument, such as the scalpel or scissors, to remove devitalized tissue. This provides an immediate improvement of the wound bed, um, but the patient needs to be monitored for signs and symptoms of sepsis, such as a fever, a fever, tachycardia, hypotension, altered level of consciousness. Okay. Only specially trained providers can do sharp debri debridement. I've never done it. And I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure if nurses can actually do it. Your book just says trained providers. So, um, I don't know that that's in our scope. Maybe if you're an NP. All right. I'm sorry, guys, this is a really long PowerPoint. There's a lot to do with the skin. So I'm going as fast as I can, but this is a really important one to know. So um, nursing interventions related to wound care continued. So applying negative pressure. So with this, we're talking about a wound vac, if anybody's ever dealt with a wound vac. So negative pressure wound therapy. This uses a closed system that applies suction, which you can see a picture of these wound vacs in these pictures. That's actually... Um, up there in that top picture, that's that little circle and the tube coming out of it. That's the actual suction. So it's sucking drainage out from that wound. Now that wound is not the, the black thing that you see in the picture. That is actually a piece of foam that they put on top of the wound. And then they put a like, um, like a dressing on top of that. And then they cut a hole in it and they create a suction there so that the, the drainage can be removed. So, um, the wound surface is packed with a foam or gauze dressing and it's sealed with an occlusive drape. Um, then the wound dressing is connected to a vacuum and it's typically used to treat chronic wounds such as a pressure injury um, or wounds that are draining a lot, 
Okay. And they also, they constantly are stimulating the wound. Like think of like how much better your circulation is after you give a massage. So this wound back is constantly massaging this wound pretty much. So getting back um, sensory feeling and healthy tissue and all of that is, is a perk of this um, wound back. Um, and then, so dressing a wound, when we're talking about dressing a wound, there's great info on types of wound dressings on page 13, 17 to 13, 19. Okay, so I'll just go over a couple ones very quickly. So transparent films, this allows the exchange of air and water between the wound and environment, between the wound and the environment while preventing bacterial contamination. So this is like a tegaderm, if you've ever heard of that. Um, gauze dressings, sometimes they're impregnated with antimicrobial agents or medications, so that can be used. Um, hydrocolloids, these are pastes or wafers or powders that typically contain hydrophilic or water-loving particles. Um, and when they're applied to the wound, those particles interact with the exudate or the drainage to form a gel that keeps that wound moist, okay? And then there's other things like hydrogels so, and, and things like that that you don't really need to know a ton about. Um, you do need to know that there's ways to support and immobilize a wound. So having binders and bandages used to hold dressing in place or to apply pressure to a wound to um, prevent hemorrhage as with like an, like an, uh, an incision or something. Um, those, are, those all exist, okay? So just determine um, what best fits your patient. And then also applying heat and cold, okay? So response to heat and cold depends on the area being treated, the nature of the injury and all of that. Um, just keep in mind that typically you're applying, when, when somebody is swollen, when they're swelling, you're gonna apply cold, okay? Cause that's gonna decrease the swelling. It's gonna cause vasoconstriction, okay? When we cause vasoconstriction, our blood vessels get smaller and, um, it's going to, to um, help the swelling, right? And then um, when we're applying heat, it causes our blood vessels to dilate, okay? So that being said, that causes, um, that can cause redness at the site, but a lot of times it's soothing to people. It's soothing, okay? Just keep in mind when you're applying a heat pad, a hot pad or a cold pack, um, never apply hot or cold directly to the skin. It always needs to be covered with something. And typically it, the general rule is 15 minutes on the site and then 15 minutes off because continuous exposure to heat and cold can also cause further skin damage. Okay. So that's important for you to know. Whew, okay. We're about to get into it here with the pressure injuries. Okay. This is a whole nother beast. So, so with this one, um, pressure injuries. So nurses play a major role in the prevention and treatment of pressure injuries, okay? They affect 15% of all hospitalized clients. It is a big problem. They are caused by unrelieved pressure to an area resulting in ischemia or decreased blood flow, right? Um, it's, it's an issue. Okay. So our first priority as a nurse is to just prevent pressure injuries, period. Okay. Um, we know that pressure is our number one problem because it causes decreased blood supply to that affected area or ischemia, which we know now, right. Which results in those sores. So frequent, frequent turning at, at the very least every two hours at the very least every two hours turning and repositioning our patients using things like heel protectors or propping up their legs and their feet on arms and pillows or on arms on pillows so that heels and elbows aren't always resting on the bed. All of these are great interventions. And you can see in this photo right here, it shows you all of the things that contribute to a pressure ulcer, Mobil mobility and activity, decreased sensation, nutrition, age, circulation, underlying health status, friction, shearing, and moisture to tissue, tissue tolerance, time and pressure all lead to a pressure ulcer. So risk factors, okay? We already know, we know all of this, right? Immobility, the, these are the same as what we just went over. Immobility, huge intrinsic risk factor, okay? 
intrinsic, meaning internal factors that are going to alter the skin tissue integrity. Okay. And then extrinsic, meaning things from the outside world. Oh, my, oh my, 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 sorry. Um, so immobility, that's an intrinsic. Okay. Immobility is going to contribute. Impaired sensation, malnourishment. We know decreased protein. We need adequate nutrition to keep our skin healthy. Aging, super, super old people, super, super young people. That doesn't mean that they are the only people that can get it, but they're at more, more at risk. And then fever, right? From the sweating, cause that maceration, things like that. Moving, moving to extrinsic risk factors, friction, anything moving up and down on our um up on our patient causing issues. So with friction, this damages that outer protective epidermal layer of skin and decreases the amount of pressure needed to develop skin lesions. Okay. Then there's pressure. Obviously that's why if our patient's laying flat in bed with their elbows on the bed and their heels on the bed and their butt on the bed, they're at risk for pressure ulcers on both elbows, both heels and their coccyx. Okay. Cause those are the bony areas that are touching the bed. If we turn them on their side and we let their knees rest against each other, we better put a pillow in, be in between those knees because that can cause a pressure ulcer right there from the pressure between the knees, right? Um, that's why it's important because we also need to keep in mind that um, pressure ulcers can occur under casts because of the pressure, under splints, if a patient has splints, that's why if they're on, if they have anything like that, that can be removable, like a hip immobilizer or, um, a, or a splint, we need to be looking at the skin underneath these areas to make sure that there's no skin breakdown. Okay. So your, your pressure points are going to be the back of your head, your shoulder blades, your elbows, your sacrum and your heels. Okay. Those are the big ones. And then shearing. So shearing occurs when epidermal layers of skin slide over the dermis, causing damage to that vascular bed. This most commonly occurs when the head of the bed is elevated and the patient slides downward, causing shear to develop. Okay. That happens very often, especially in elderly people. And then exposure to moisture. We know this, especially in the form of um, urine and feces. Okay. Urine, very acidic. Feces, very acidic. We need to maybe uh, make sure that we are, are doing frequent assessments on that and keeping them as warm and dry, their skin as clean and warm and dry as possible. All right, so moving on, moving on. So with pressure injuries, so again, pressure injuries, otherwise also called a decubitus ulcer or a bed sore. You can hear those terms interchangeably. This is an injury to the skin that typically occurs over a bony prominence, okay? Patients that are at risk, we already talked about these, okay? So typically, you have to determine the stage of the pressure ulcer. That is our job as nurses. You need to be able to look at a wound and determine what stage it is, okay? Um, stages one to four, there's stage one to stage four, and they all are classified by the tissue involvement. Okay. Stages three and four involve tissue necrosis. Okay. There's also some called a suspected, suspected deep tissue injury an unstageable pressure injury. And we'll go through what all of these are and what they look like here in just a moment. And then just, just here for your reference, using the push tool is important, which you should have access to wherever you work. So um, you can see information about that on 1299 to, to 1300. And so that just will tell you a little bit about that, but it's uh, good to review. Okay, so let's talk about a stage one pressure injury. I believe there's a table about these on your book on page um, 1303. So check that out in there. It's important for you to know these. So um, stage one. So a stage one is a localized, which means um, it's confined to a certain area, right? It's not spread super wide. Um, a localized area of intact skin. So the skin is intact. There is no actual wound there. However, it occurs to be non-blanchable redness over a bony prominence, okay? What blanchable means is that if this patient, as you can see in this picture, has a very red bottom, if I were to put my finger on that area and I would push my finger down onto her skin and let it go, 
it would not turn white and then back red. Blanching means it turns white and then it comes back to red. That is what blanching means, okay? So if, if it blanches, it's not considered a stage one, but that is your warning sign that you then need to move your patient because it will turn into a stage one if you let them stay there long enough, okay? So in order to be a stage one, it has to be a localized area over a bony prominence and it has to be non-blanchable. So when I put my finger on that and I push down and I let go, it's gonna stay red. It's gonna stay the same color as, it's, as it looks like right now, okay? There cannot be any maroon or purple discoloration. The area may be painful, firm, soft, warmer or colder compared with other tissue. Um, and then that discoloration will remain for 30 minutes after the pressure is relieved, okay? So once we find this, we need to just move our patient. Treatment for a stage one pressure ulcer is to relieve the pressure, okay? This is not the point of no return yet. We can easily, easily prevent a pressure ulcer at this stage, okay? Just turn them off that area, okay? Relieve the pressure. So this is a stage two. So stage two pressure area. This involves partial thickness loss of the dermis, okay? Stage two pressure injuries are open, but they are shallow and they have a reddish pink wound bed, okay? Open but shallow, reddish pink wound bed, as you can see. There is no slough or bruising present. I'll show you what slough is in the next slide, but there's none in this one, okay? No slough or bruising present. Um, they may, it may also be an intact, open, or ruptured serum-filled blister or a shiny, dry ulcer. Okay, so if you see a blister here on the on this pressure area and it's red and blistered, that's also a stage two. Okay. Um, we do not use this stage to describe skin tears or tape burns or perineal dermatitis or maceration or excoriation. Okay, those are not pressure areas. Those are different. So we would never call that a stage two. Okay. Um, Yes, so that, that's kind of what you're looking at. Very shallow, no slough or bruising, okay? Stage three. All right, so stage three is a deep crater on this. This looks like, this looks to me like on the back of the heel, like maybe this was, um, is that what it looks like? I have no idea what that is. I wanna say it's the back of the heel, but it's kind of weird looking placement, so. Let's just say it's the back of the heel. Um, so anyway, a deep crater for a stage three, deep crater characterized by full thickness skin loss, full thickness, okay, with damage or necrosis of subcutaneous tissue, adipose tissue is visible, okay? So in this um, particular, in this particular wound, you can see the adipose tissue there. And, um, Yeah, I have slough in my, in my very next one. I'll show you what that is. Um, so we can see that on off to the left side, you can see a little bit of that adipose tissue there, that fatty tissue there, okay? Um, so with the stage three, it may extend down to, but not through that underlying fascia, okay? You may see undermining, um, you may not. You cannot in a stage three see bone and you cannot see any tendons, okay? Not for a stage three. That would be for stage four. Um, some stage three pressure injuries can be extremely deep when located in areas with significant adipose tissue. Okay. So that's a stage three. It goes into the adipose tissue. That's the big one. Okay. So stage one, not blanchable, redness, right? Redness that can't blanch. Stage two, shallow, not allowed to have slough or eschar. Stage three can have slough or eschar, but this one, this particular one does not, but that's okay. But it does have to have adipose tissue, right? That's the big, the big differing factor, adipose tissue. And we see that there, okay? And then moving on to stage four, this is a nasty one. So 
But the stage four, this involves full thickness skin loss with extensive destruction, tissue necrosis, and damage to muscle, bone, or support stru structures. With these, exposed bone and tendons are visible or directly palpable. So you can see the bones and tendons in this one. So that's how we know it's a stage four, right? Slough or eschar may be present. They don't have to be present, but they may be. So if you look at this um, picture, Slough is this brownish tan stuff that's all over the, the surface of the wound, aside from this part that's pink. This little part that's pink, um, it, there's no slough or eschar there, but the, the slough is this other part that is kind of covering the wound. And then eschar is over here to the left of the wound where it's dark black. Okay, eschar is a dark black leathery necrotic tissue, which means it's dead. Okay. Um, it may have undermining, it may have um, tunneling and all of that, okay? Um, the depth of a stage four pressure injury varies by location, but they can be shallow on the bridge of the nose from maybe a patient's glasses, right? They could be on the ear from oxygen tubing or glasses. Um, and they would, they would appear to be shallow because those areas don't have subcutaneous tissue. Whereas if they were to be on the coccyx, there would be subcutaneous tissue there. Um, a stage four injury can extend into the muscle and supporting structures, okay? And often these types of wounds that are this bad require a full year to heal. Um, even once they are healed, the site remains at severe risk for um, future injury because the scar tissue is not as strong as the original tissue was, okay? So that's your stage four. Then we move on to a deep tissue injury, okay? So if you look at this one, this is an area of skin that is intact, okay? So nothing is open, but it is persistently discolored. It might be purplish, it might be a deep red color, but it's painful to the patient and it's boggy, which means it's not firm, it's kind of squishy, okay? Um, pain and temperature change often come before the skin and color changes. And um, occurs to, it occurs because of damage to the underlying soft tissue, okay? Findings can be subtle that, so that the deep tissue injury is not even recognized until after severe tissue damage has occurred underneath the surface of the skin. So we can't see the damage, but you can bet that underneath there, there's some stuff going on that we don't wanna know about, right? So it may heal, but it also may evolve further and become covered in thin eschar, rapidly exposing additional layers of tissue by opening up, okay? Um, so just remember with a deep tissue injury, the skin is intact, but it's persistently discolored, okay? And then underneath that may be a big problem if it were to open up. And then this is considered an unstageable pressure injury, right? So this involves a full thickness skin loss, okay? But the base of the wound is obscured by slough or eschar. So this, this wound that you're looking at right here, is a, it's a deep wound, but you can't tell how deep it is because you can't see the wound. It's completely covered by eschar. So it is unstageable, okay? Until enough slough or eschar is removed to expose the base of the wound and the true depth, you cannot determine the stage. So it's considered unstageable, okay? Remember, we never want to remove or soften a stable piece of eschar. It serves as the body's natural cover, okay? So we never mess with that. We just keep treating the wound until it falls off itself. Um, you can always, as you guys know how much I love Registered Nurse RN, she is just fabulous. So if you visit registerednursern.com, there is a great review of the integumentary system and pressure injuries, okay? Um, the link is here in this PowerPoint, which you guys should all have access to, to be able to click on that. Okay. We're not going to watch that in class, but it's a great review. We'll really help you study for your test. So test your knowledge. So the nurse administrator for a nursing home determines the rate of pressure injury in residents has increased for the second consecutive year. What are at least five possible reasons for this occurrence? So let's talk through this. So patients at risk for developing pressure injury are those with immobility, 
and other prolonged and unrelieved pressure in combination with friction and shear and moisture, incontinence, poor nutrition, perfusion, um, what else? Age, skin condition, and altered level of consciousness, right? So nursing care may be inadequate for the nursing home residents in the following areas, okay? It may be that staff are failing to assess the resident's skin integrity as recommended. Um, it may mean that they're not frequently turning and repositioning their patients every two hours. So those bony prominences are causing pressure on their fragile skin. Um, it may be that friction and shear are contributing too much, right? Maybe the nurses and assistive staff are dragging patients up the bed instead of using assistive devices like a transfer sheet or a lift or the help of others, right? Um, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a, a, an incontinence care thing. Maybe patients are waiting too long between being changed. Um, maybe the patients aren't getting adequate nutrition. Um, same with hydration. It could be a variety of these things. All right, test your knowledge. So the client has a wound that is 0.4 centimeters long and 3.2 centimeters wide. There is only a light amount of exudate and the granulation tissue is seen the push score for this would be A9, B18, C15, or D22. So again, as I said earlier, the push school, there, there, you can actually see it in your book. It's not on my PowerPoint, but you can see it in your book. Um, and it gives a number score to every category that was mentioned in this test question. So I'm going to show you the answer here. The answer is 15. In my little bubble here, you'll see how I got that. And I got that from that push tool for pressure injuries in your book on page 1299 to 1300. Okay, so you can just review that there. And then nursing interventions. What are we going to do about it, right? It's our job as the nurse. What are we going to do about it? We want to prevent it, right? We want to conduct a pressure injury admission assessment for all of our patients. We want to reassess the risk for all patients every single day. We want to assess um, their skin every single day. We want to manage moisture, make sure our patients are, are cleaned up after they're incontinent and make sure their skin is dry. We want to optimize nutrition and hydration, and we want to minimize pressure, right? So meticulous skin care, skin care and moisture control, applying barrier creams. Um, we want to make sure that if we have to use therapeutic mattresses, a lot of times there'll be low air loss mattresses that are a lot more... Um, comfortable and not as hard as regular mattresses and, and help in that um, uh, relieving pressure area. And then client and family teaching as well, as well as teaching our assistive personnel and being open with communication that our patients need turned every two hours. And then test your knowledge. So the basis for safe, effective nursing care is thinking, doing, caring. You are the nurse caring for a patient with obesity complicated by type 2 diabetes. She has a diabetic ulcer on the bottom of her foot. Other than physical care of her wound, what patient experiences would you consider when devising a caring and compassionate plan for her to, for her care at home? Okay. Um, so I would say for this patient, we want to just make sure that um, we're addressing her pain. Okay. Typically diabetic ulcers, are typically painless, okay? Because typically diabetics can't feel their feet very well. However, they can cause discomfort, especially when they get infected. We wanna address her, address her problem of social isolation, right? Because open wounds that are red and necrotic can be unsightly to others. So this can lead to embarrassment for a patient. Um, we want to discourage frustration. These ulcers are chronic and typically they're slow to heal. So we want to, um, we want to sympathize with, with her feelings and we want to discourage frustration and hopelessness for them. We want to encourage positive thoughts and look, looking to the future. We also may want to address her fear. So diabetic foot ulcers that become necrotic can result in an amputation, especially in diabetics, especially, especially, especially. Foot care is so important in diabetics. And then inconvenience. So diabetic foot ulcers with delayed healing and tissue necrosis require expensive long-term wound care. Uh, also requires special footwear to reduce pressure on healing tissue and causes repeated visits by healthcare providers. So all these interventions can be expensive and time consuming. So that would be important as well. All right. And that's all we got.